We we'll have the second uh, talk of the session, and we have Daniel Franza talking about efficient quantum gap sampling. All right. Uh, so yeah, uh, thanks for the organizers for having the opportunity to speak here today. So uh, this is joint work with uh, Cambis Jose uh, in Paris and Alvaro in, in Madrid. And first, uh, probably you noticed that the title of the talk is different from the one on the on the program, uh, and also from the archive paper. Uh, and this is because when we submitted the paper for disclosure, there are two parts of it. The second part was was wrong. So uh, thanks to uh, Anthony Chen for uh, um, noticing our, our mistake. Uh, in the meantime, we we had a, uh, um, found a, a way to to fix the proof, uh, not getting exactly the same result we had before. I'm glad to talk about it. Uh, later if you're interested, um, but um, kindly the, the PC members agreed to just consider the first half of our paper, which is hopefully correct in the submission, uh, which I'm going to talk about now. So uh, yeah, that's that's why there's going to miss, uh, you're going to probably miss half of, of the results from, from this paper. All right. So, um, well, if you don't know what quantum Gibbs states are, they're going to be the, the main actors or the protagonists of, of this talk. Um, you know, they, you're just given some, some Hamiltonian H uh, and some inverse temperature beta. And, um, you know, you, you might want to prepare these, these quantum states uh, for, for many reasons. They appear in, in physics, let's say in statistical mechanics, but also in some quantum algorithms, say for machine learning, uh, also for, for optimization and so on. So there are many reasons why uh, you'd like to actually uh, prepare uh, these states. Uh, and um, well, um, you know, formalization happens um, all over the place, right? Uh, and uh, you'd expect that at least in some regimes, you should be able to uh, simulate these, these Gibbs states efficiently with, with a quantum computer. However, we didn't have, or, or even in some regimes with, with a classical computer, in fact, uh, but we didn't have like some sort of universal result saying that, uh, you know, with, for, for these classes of Hamiltonians and these ranges of beta, you can actually prepare these states uh, efficiently on a quantum computer. And this is um, precisely the, the topic of, of this work. And there's been a lot of activity uh, since we put this out and uh, we're um, understanding how to prepare these quantum Gibbs states uh, I mean, our understanding is improving a lot over the last few months. Um, so, yeah, so maybe um, one possible way you could think of, of preparing such, such quantum Gibbs states is to try to emulate how people, uh, or one of the main methods people use to sample from these things classically, uh, which are Markov chain Monte Carlo methods. So uh, they work very well in practice. People use them all over the place. And in some regimes, you can actually prove that these algorithms uh, work um, efficiently. And uh, a big open question is, can we find quantum versions of such algorithms to actually prepare uh, quantum Gibbs states, right? And um, there is, oh, sorry. Uh, there is a standard way of, of getting something which is, in some sense, an analog of a, let's say, uh, Monte Carlo uh, algorithm for quantum systems, uh, which tries to mimic how we model formalization, uh, which are Davis uh, generators, where you assume you're, you're given so your Hamiltonian, uh, and then you write down some interaction between a BAF and, and your system with some, with some jump operators. And uh, this gives rise to a so-called quantum dynamical semigroup, which is the generator of, of your same quantum Markov chain, uh, which is then guaranteed to converge uh, to this Gibbs state if you pick these, uh, this function here uh, wisely and, and the jump operators and, and so on. So this is like some sort of standard recipe to how to get some chain that will converge to the Gibbs state if you run it for, for long enough. Now, this, is, this was done in the 70s, so why aren't we too happy about this thing? So um, it has some very nice features. Uh, why aren't we happy, right? It, uh, it's, it has convergence. It satisfies a quantum version of so-called detailed balance, which is a condition that uh, not only tells you that the, the, fixed, uh, that the Gibbs state is the fixed point of this evolution, 
but also tells you that this map is Hermitian in a well-chosen scalar product. Um, and this allows you to study the convergence of the Markov chain by doing linear algebra, which is something we all like. Um, and uh, you can even argue that you know, this, this comes from a physical process. So these are very nice uh, properties of this, this Davis generator. Um, however, um, there are some things we don't like too much uh, about the, the Davis generator. Um, which is the fact that uh, the, the terms in this Limbladian are very much non-local. So, you know, if you look at uh, the Metropolis algorithm, it's mostly based on, on local flips classically, right? And uh, it requires a lot of uh, precision and energy if you would actually want to implement this on a quantum computer. So uh, it's, it's kind of difficult to, to simulate these Davis generators. And the fact that the, the jumps are very non-local makes it difficult to, to um, analyze them um, and, and get rigorous results on, let's say, how long it takes to formalize uh, for these uh, Davis generators. And um, so in some sense, uh, the, the, they do have this detailed balance like the classical metropolis algorithm, but you know, like it, we're missing these other ingredients, right? And other people uh, have um, sort of put forward proposals of how to do quantum, uh, quantum versions of metropolis, like for instance, the quantum metropolis by Temin. But again, the updates require some version of phase estimation are very non-local. It's hard to analyze the, this algorithm. At least I don't know how to do it. Um, and, uh, and there are other works going in this direction. There's really a lot of literature, but uh, they're mostly focusing on, on the only come with exponential guarantees in the sense that uh, we only know that it might take exponential time and system size uh, to prepare Gibbs states with these uh, samplers even in the, uh, for, for high temperature uh, Gibbs states. Now, um, there has been uh, a recent paper uh, where they construct a new family of Limbladians. As I said, there's been a lot of activity in this corner of the literature. There have been some other constructions uh, since. Um, and what is nice about this first uh, proposal is that the, the terms in this Limbladian, they are not precisely local, so they're, so they're even if you have, let's say, a local Hamiltonian on a 2D lattice, the jump operators will not be like strictly local, but they're quasi-local in the sense that they have some sort of tail. Um, uh, and they satisfy exact detailed balance, which is again great because then we can do a linear algebra to understand them. And uh, they also give a recipe on how to efficiently implement these uh, generators on a quantum computer. So if you show that these generators um, converge sufficiently fast, then you also get a quantum algorithm out of it. Uh, and yeah, so the question then is, of course, how fast does it converge? So if I know that you know, I can implement this, this Limblad uh, evolution for some time t using these resources, which is, which is coming from the paper by uh, Chen et al., um, the question is how large does T have to be so that rho, uh, ETL rho is close to, to the Gibbs state. This is usually referred to as the mixing time. And there are multiple techniques to control mixing times, but here we're gonna focus on something called the, the spectral gap of L. Um, and essentially, if you can show, which here I'm denoting by alpha L, and essentially if you show that this spectral gap is larger than C, then uh, you, you get that the, the trace distance between the output of the semigroup, irrespective of what the initial state was, and your Gibbs state here should be, uh, sigma here should be understood as the Gibbs state, will be bounded by this. So, you know, you just have to pick T to be some, some polynomial. Uh, and uh, if, if C, for instance, is, is of constant order, uh, and you can make the, the, the trace distance exponentially small. All right. Um, so what we show uh, in this paper first is that for a specific choice of, of jump operators, uh, and actually you can just pick them as like two qubit polys, and you have a Hamiltonian age such that you have some sort of Lieb-Robinson bound. So essentially this is a bound on how fast 
information propagates uh, under time evolution with age, unitary time evolution. Uh, so, you know, this is in particular satisfied for all, let's say, local Hamiltonians on a lattice. Then uh, as long as the, the inverse temperature is smaller than some threshold temperature, which is of constant order, then uh, the, the, the spectral gap, this C here, is really of, of constant order. So this tells us that uh, this um, uh, Limbladian of Chen et al. gives you an efficient algorithm for all high temperature Gibbs states of, let's say, physical systems. Now, you might interject and say, oh, great, but I mean, high temperature, I mean, this is the kind of stuff I can do with my tensor networks or my whatever other classical simulation method. Who cares? Uh, I wouldn't want to see this as an application of quantum computing. And I agree. But uh, why do I think it's still important? Well, because you could say the same thing uh, about classical samplers, right? So um, in classical, for classical algorithms, people also try to show that they converge well or they work well for high temperatures, right? And I think this gives us confidence that uh, they might also work well for more complicated distributions where it's maybe uh, impossible to actually show that they work well. So if you want to convince me that you have a good uh, or a good candidate for how to sample from these Gibbs states at let's say lower temperatures, then you need to at least show that they work well for let's say product distributions or then the next step, high temperature, right? So that's why I think this is still interesting. And uh, as far as I know before this work, again, there's been a lot of activity since, I'm gonna comment on that later. We didn't have like these efficient algorithms for such a universal class. Um, so how does the proof work? Um, it actually goes back to like closed systems. So because of this detailed balance condition, we can actually map this, this uh, Lindblad evolution to a, a Hamiltonian by consider some sort of purification of the system. And what is important is that the underlying space doesn't depend on the temperature theta. Okay, so we, we get this family of of Hamiltonians that are defined on the same Hilbert space uh, with, with some parameter beta, which encodes the, the temperature. And uh, we have the property that uh, the purified version of the Gibbs state is the ground state of, of uh, this Hamiltonian. It's also um, frustration free and the energy is, is zero, okay? And uh, the nice thing about this Hamiltonian is that it has exponentially decaying interactions, okay? So um, even it's not strictly local, but it has exponentially decaying uh, interactions. Um, and if you pick beta equals zero, then uh, which would correspond to having the Gibbs state as the maximally mixed state, um, the corresponding uh, semigroup you get is just some sort of local depolarizing channel. And for that one, you can easily compute the gap. Everything is very easy. So we know that for beta equals zero, the, the Lembladian is, is very easy to work with. We know what the gap is. Um, now we can also show that because the, the ground state is just a maximally mixed state, that it satisfies a thing called local topological order. And there are these very strong and nice results uh, uh, on the perturbation theory of, of the gap of uh, such Hamiltonians uh, by, for instance, Bravi, Hastings, and Michalakis, um, which allow us to say that there, uh, we can uh, perturb our, our, our Hamiltonian in some way and around beta equals zero and still have um, a gap. Okay, so um, essentially by showing, uh, by uh, making use of these very strong results, we are then able to perturb these Hamiltonians in terms of, of the temperature and get some finite range uh, for which the, the gap is still of, of, of constant order. So that's essentially how um, our proof works. All right, um, now another thing people wanna do with quantum Gibbs states is consider the so-called thermal field double states. So people tell me this has some connection to, to black holes and I don't understand this uh, at all. I already had a conversation about this in the morning. Someone told me there's a poster about it. I'm looking forward to learning a bit more about this. Um, but anyways, people care about uh, preparing purifications of, of Gibbs states as well. They're called thermal field doubles. 
Um, and uh, as far as I know, there were also no, uh, except for some limited classes, um, like ways to prepare these these Gibbs states, uh, these purified states, in a more uh, like generic way, say. Um, and uh, our work also immediately gives you uh, an efficient quantum algorithm to do that. Um, namely, uh, we can again look at these these Hamiltonians we obtain by uh, purifying the the sorry by by mapping the the, the Lindbergians into these Hamiltonians, um, and it turns out that then. We can do uh, again a perturbation in beta equals zero until the desired temperature. Do adiabatic uh, preparation now, where we vary this parameter beta, and uh, we can show that you can efficiently prepare the the purification. So um, here the scaling is is a bit worse. So for preparing the actual Gibbs state, we have uh, exponential. Uh, sorry, uh, we have a log dependency on the precision. If you want to do the purification, it's polynomial, but it's also polynomial time algorithm to prepare these um, purifications for a very generic class of, of Hamiltonians and some uh, constant uh, temperature. All right. Um, and, you know, the, the, the proof just uses the fact that we have this uniform bound on the gap, and then you just need to... Uh, pick your favorite uh, adiabatic theorem and uh, plug in the estimates you get. All right, so uh, this moves us to the uh, conclusion. Uh, so again, I think we, this, was, this was one of the first results on um, the, the uh, exact preparation of high temperature Gibbs states and also the, the thermal field double state. Um, and there are quite a few questions that, that come out of our work. So uh, first, um, I mentioned that there is a way, like the Chen et al. give a way of, of preparing these, these Lindbladians on a quantum computer, but they require fancy block encodings and things like that. Uh, so it would be interesting to see if there's a more, let's say, natural uh, way of, of, of simulating these, these dynamics that require less uh, quantum resources, say. Um, another question is that I showed you that essentially our algorithm works by, or our argument works by perturbing around the maximally mixed state. Uh, and we use the fact that, you know, uh, there it's really easy to get a handle on what's going on. And you use the fact that it's, uh, these uh, evolutions are quasi local and have other nice properties. Can we extend this to perturbations around other uh, states of, of interest? Um, Another question I find uh, really interesting is like, how well do these um, evolutions proposed by Chen and now also these follow-up works um, by, for instance, the group of Lin Lin, how well do these uh, generators actually work in practice also for, for lower temperatures, right? Um, more applications of Gibbs states, of course, and um, maybe a bit more on, on question number five which is the, I, I said that there's a constant threshold for the temperature over which we know it's efficient, but I didn't give you exact constants. And the reason I didn't give them is that I don't know them. Uh, and uh, there was uh, another work by Teng and collaborators that uh, also showed efficient preparation of Gibbs states at high temperature. Um, but I can say that uh, their threshold temperature is, uh, I mean, uh, worse than ours for high locality. Because we can, even though I don't know the exact threshold temperature, I can tell you that uh, it scales inverse linearly with the locality of the original Hamiltonian, and there scales quadratically. So at least if you allow for uh, Hamiltonians acting on more and more particles, our threshold temperature will be uh, better. Uh, but it would still be very nice to get constants to, to compare. And, oh, sorry. Oh, no. Uh, so, uh, and moreover, um, this work showed many nice things we don't have. For instance, they showed that these high temperature Gibbs states are all separable. So uh, an important question is, uh, is our temperature range also uh, covering Gibbs states which are actually uh, entangled in some way? That would also be interesting. Uh, and just with my last uh, 15 seconds, just to let you know that uh, we quite have quite a few postdoc positions available 
with both Kambiz and I. And uh, if you're interested in working on this and GIP samplers or GIP states in general, just uh, let me know. So yeah, thanks for the attention. Questions? So you, you said that you don't know the, the constant, but is it close to one or like it should be very close to one or how? I have no idea. So the reason, okay, maybe I can tell you why I don't know the constant. And the constant is that the reason is that we're using these results by Hastings and Michalakis and they're very, um, it's, it's very hard to extract things uh, from there. So frankly, I, I have, have no idea because there are quite, quite a few steps in the proof where they show that there exists some con universal constant such that blah, blah, blah. And we weren't able to determine those things. So frankly, I don't know. Yeah. Hello. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, quick question about, do we know about lower bounds on, on how quickly, oh, oh, in the sense that uh, you showed the, an upper bound on uh, the, the sampling. Mm -hmm. Do we know about lower bounds as well? On, on these things oh, or so, like high enough temperature or something like that. so like if you want to say that oh uh beyond this temperature is very yeah so actually yeah so there's been a lot of work uh in this direction recently as well i think that maybe a month ago there was a paper by james watson and someone else whose name i forgot showing that uh you know that um i forgot what the exact assumptions are but they showed that um under some complexity periodic assumptions, even some some uh, sampling above a certain threshold is 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 hard. So uh, there's there's some recent work in this direction. I can point you to the reference. Um, yeah, I th thanks for the talk. That was very nice. Um, I'm just wondering. Uh, it seems like tacitly here, there's an assumption that this uh, this Davies process will eventually give you something that looks like a thermal uh, state. I'm wondering what happens for Hamiltonians that have things like scars and that kind of thing. Like, does this approach just sort of break down if you have these kinds of artifacts, these eigenstates in the Hamiltonian that don't look like thermal states on the subsystem? Or uh, is that not something that uh, you've considered? Um, I'm not 100% sure I understood the question, but um, maybe just to say that, uh, like, this is the only thing we need. So, you know, uh, as long as, as this holds, and this holds, for instance, for, for any Hamiltonian on a lattice or on a graph that is well-behaved in some sense. Uh, so uh, it's even you could have like exponentially decaying directions and things like that. So I would say that for, for most Hamiltonians that are, let's say, physically motivated, then this, this assumption should be satisfied. So it should be pretty generic. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the talk. Uh, I'm just wondering about your, uh, you, you have done by adiabatic, right? Yes. Uh, and I haven't seen your uh, gap dependence of the uh, convergence. Ah, right, because the, 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 we show that the gap is, is constant. Oh, uh, it is a constant. Yes, yes. Yeah, okay, because you know that the classically you can guarantee the convergence by the inverse of the gap, right? Yeah. And then for a fixed temperature. So the idea that for each temperature we can then Converge for that, and then change the temperature because of some perturbation, maybe, mm -hmm. and then prepare another Markovian operator, and then get the convergence and so on. And you have the quantum quantum part of that. It's really close to that, mm -hmm. and the convergence is the inverse of the quadratic of the gap. Mm -hmm. So this is a kind of uh, the quantum metropolis haste uh, versus the metropolis haste, and that can go for whatever temperature that you like it. And you yes. can do also looking by adiabatic theorems this approach. Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. But as the, the, the gap is, is like independent of system size, you don't see a big difference there. Um, yeah, thanks for the talk. And what I wonder is there are like many different works about above a certain temperature, shala, 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 efficient. Yes. And like just to mention to others, like the recent one by Evan Tang and, and co-authors. Yes. And also like some 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 older one by Martin Klisch about locality of temperature where he has some sub result about mm, sure. decay of correlations above a certain temperature that blah blah blah. Is there are these results somehow all connected or are there certain details in the statements slash assumptions that strictly separate them in some sense? 
Yeah, so, I mean, very hard question to answer uh, in a concise way, uh, but let's put it this way. So, for instance, this this uh, great result by Martin you mentioned, for instance, is more about, let's say, computing, let's say, some local expectation value. Here, we're, we're giving you the whole Gibbs state. So this gives you more power. You can, for instance, sample from it and things, things like that, right? So there are different notions of simulation, different notions of what you can do, uh, but... Uh, yeah, um, I mean, for instance, one thing that the result by Martin and the Tang have in common is that they use, for instance, cluster expansion techniques or things related to that, which is not something we necessarily do here. So there are also some technical uh, differences, but I'm, I'm glad to, to expand on that over the coffee minute, yeah. So let's thank Daniel again. Thanks.